you and me. That's how good this team is. Hey guys, welcome back to RBR. And I know just how distract, please, by all means, just oogle away at it. After all, the new DBS Superleggera is a car that would perhaps even give Bond himself pause. And that's with the V12 engine off. So already some amazing cars coming out of the second generation of Aston Martin, all based on that bonded Animalian platform. But as was the brief given to the designers and the engineers, all of them look different and all of them drive different. So we started with the DB11 with its coupe and volante versions, and it was deemed the gentleman by Aston Martin. Then came the Hunter, which we absolutely loved on the channel. Funnily enough, that was the first video that we did our special style of RBR magic here. And the Hunter, it's got its own look, very much inspired by the Vulcan. And then now this DBS, which they call a brute in a suit. And it really does look completely different to the DB11, sitting five millimeters lower, much wider, a totally different car. And as you'll see later, it drives completely differently as well. Now, most of you will know this is not actually the first DBS. The first one actually followed on from the DB6. And it was in fact even featured in a Bond film uh, on Her Majesty's Secret Service and not as well known. But Super Legera, which means super light, was a method of construction that was used across DB4, DB5, DB6, and it relates to the use of small diameter steel tubes with alloy on top of it to create the car shape and give a super lightweight construction. This was used in those iconic Aston Martin cars. And now that name returns to this, the DBS Super Legera. Now the DBS that you guys might remember a bit better was the one from Daniel Craig's first outing as Bond in Casino Royale, in which that gorgeous car unfortunately took quite a tumble when saving the uh, tied up Vespa. Couldn't you have like kind of squirmed out of the way or something? Now that car of course was a huge hit. It's still I think one of the best looking Aston Martins ever. It was available in automatic and in manual. The manual version is still very sought after even now. But now the DBS is back and it's no longer a V12 with 510 brake horsepower. Now it's a V12 twin turbo with wait for it, 715 brake horsepower and 900 Newton meters of torque. This is now the third car in Boss Andy Palmer's second century plan for Aston Martin. It's based on the DB11, of course, and thus it's based on that bonded aluminum platform. But as the name suggests, super leggero or super light, it uses lightweight construction. So there's extensive use of carbon fiber on the outer panels of the car, and it drops the weight of this DBS by 72 kg versus the normal DB11, which is, of course, a significant amount of weight drop. You can even see the extensive use of carbon fiber when you open up and look at certain parts of the car, particularly the bonnet and the boot lid, which just look incredible. But I really want to show you quite deliberately how different this is compared to the DB11, because it truly is a much more aggressive and wider car. So if I show you again, just how different they are, then you start to see the differences. The front end, let's start with that. First of all, much, much wider, much wider. It's a completely different design on the front. The front mouth with this huge air intake to cool the engine reminds me very much of that kind of Zagato design from the recent Zagato cars. I'm sure you guys will agree. Now my favorite bit of the front, which you won't notice that much unless I point it out to you, is the honeycomb structure of the front grille. It's really special and this honeycomb design was kind of the basis of the design language for DBS. And it looks stunning. There's a nice little story behind it as well. The actual, the shape of it was so complex that they couldn't create one single CAD file of it. It had to be multiple different pieces. Those of you who do 3D modeling will understand this a lot better. And it really does look stunning in real life. You kind of don't appreciate it in pictures, but you see it up close. It's one of the best looking grills I've ever seen on a car. You also get the brand new headlights, which although have a similar graphic inside to DB11, the shape of them, very different. They're smoked out. The bonnet, extremely muscular, huge, huge width on this car. And you've got the big nostrils, almost fire coming out of here. And then you can, you can actually see inside the engine bonnet, 
as well through those. I love how Superleggera is back on the bonnet, just like in the classic DB4, DB5 and DB6. It's such a lovely touch that links back to those icons. The front just looks amazing. Then you come around the side, it all slims down back into DB11 type size. You see the floating C-pillar made famous by that car. I'm gonna come back on the side later. And then you look at the rear, just how gorgeous this rear looks. Now, the DB11 was almost Marmite with its rear end. This, in my opinion, nails it. It looks so much more handsome than that car. The slim lights, which are smoked out in this particular spec, you've got the quad exhaust system, extensive use of carbon fiber in the lower diffuser, which in itself is so aggressive. And of course, the width you have on the rear compared to DB11 as well, betrays this car's sporting intent. And then you see that there's not even an Aston Martin wing badge in the rear, just confidently Aston Martin written there instead. And then you notice the carbon fiber spoiler, and that's why I said I wanted to come back to the side because just like the DB11, there's clever use of aerodynamics here. So you'll remember from my DB11 review, if you've seen it, Aston have something called curly cues here, which they got out of the Vulcan and the GTE racing car. And what it does is pushes air from this wheel arch through here into the floating C pillar. And then I'll show you this now in another shot through the boot and out where the carbon fiber spoiler is. And in the DB11, this was called Airblade, and in this it's called Airblade 2 because of the new construction of the spoiler on the rear. And it creates 180 kg of downforce on this DBS, and it needs it considering how much power this car has. Love the carbon ceramics finished in a very light bronze here, and they're huge on this car. So we've got 410 millimeters on the front, 360 millimeters on the rear, and I'll show you what the stopping power is like later. I really like the 21 inch wheels of this particular spec. You can also get Y spoke wheels as well. I'll show you what those look like. Overall, this is a very configurable car as all Aston Martins are. I really love the little touches of gold, which is an optional extra in the engine bay. And I love how in the, just like in the DB11, when you drop the bonnet, it closes itself. It's just oozes quality. Coming in the future, we already know that a DBX will eventually be unveiled and it's going to be made in a new factory in Wales. So that's gonna be a completely new line for Aston Martin. And I would expect there to be some more versions of the DBS. We've already seen a Volante flying around the ring, and I'd be very surprised if there isn't eventually a DBS AMR, a more racing focused version. Now, since the last two DBSs were featured in Bond films, I'm gonna make a prediction and say with Bond 25 coming up, this has got to be 007's next car. I'm sure of it. Anyway, guys, let's go inside. Let's have a look at what the interior looks like. And I want to show you how mad this V12 sounds. So what do you think of this interior? This leather is called red oxide. It's kind of, it's not really a pure red. It's a weird mix of kind of red and tan, but I really love the look of it. I've really missed the interior of a DB car. It's been a while since we reviewed our last one. And there's just some X factor about the way this is made. It's not the most technologically advanced car from the inside, but it has some X factor in the way it's designed. I don't know whether it's the symmetry, the incredible leather work, the way that the leather smells, how you sit in these amazing Sports Plus seats. There's just something about it that just, it's addictive. You wanna spend time in this car. And essentially that's really what you want in a GT car, you've got to want to love sitting in here. And I think in the DBs, you really do. Now, if you've seen a DB11, this is all gonna look very similar to you because it is essentially identical. And members of the press have been very quick to point this out as a negative. And I kind of get what they're saying because this is priced so much higher than a normal DB11. But then we also have that quite similar in other cars in this industry as well. I mean, think about it, if you go from say a normal three series into an M3, the increase of the trim is not really the same as the increase of the price you're paying. It's essentially the same interior. Now Aston Martin customers are gonna be used to that coming into a car like the DBS from the DB11. The DBS does however get its own specific leather trimming and it's called a tri-axle quilt and it looks absolutely gorgeous. You'll notice this pattern across all of the leather of the car. I must point out certain sections where the leather craftsmanship is just 
unlike anything I've seen in the car industry. And just look at that roof in isolation of everything else. Then you look at the armrest here, it looks absolutely gorgeous. It's carried across on the door cards. The seats themselves look incredible. But you see, if this isn't to your taste, Aston Martin interiors are some of the most customizable in the world. And I'll show you some other configurations of DBS that I managed to get inside and have a look at. And you can see how different they are. You could go crazy with Alcantara, keep the car black, go with different piping, and really just make it your own. You can change, here we've got sort of a blacked out chrome aluminium trim, but instead you could have traditional carbon fiber. We've got chopped carbon fiber in this specification. Again, you can have normal carbon fiber, you can have wood, and you can really change every aspect, the stitching color, two-tone leather, whatever you want to make it your own. And you can even get a special carbon fiber steering wheel just to make this stand out that much. So it really depends how far you want to take the spec. I do understand where the press come from though, and I agree with them in certain areas. One of those areas is the driver zone. I really feel like the DBS deserved its own graphics in the digital screen here. To have the same ones as DB11 is a bit of a letdown for me. I think it very easily, in my opinion, could have been changed into something that was unique to DBS. I also love having the ability to change the drive modes and suspension on the steering wheel. As I've said in my AMG reviews, I find this to be a lot safer than having all the nonsense around this area for the important driving stuff. It's square shaped, which is my favorite shape of steering wheel. It's nice and small in diameter. The rear has very much occasional seating. If you saw my eight series review recently, I put a nine year old in the back of that. There's less space than that car had. Now, if you want to see more about the car's infotainment system and all the options here, I would suggest you have a look at my DB11 Coupe review because I went into probably too much detail about that in that review. So I'll leave a link to that down below and you can see that. For this car, I want to show you what this V12 bi-turbo engine sounds like. So let's get straight to it. I'm going to start it off first in Sport Plus so you can hear the full Monster Awaken and then we'll go through the other modes. I love how you press the brake pedal and the engine start-stop highlights red. It's just those little details that really endear me to the Astons. Powerful startup, a V12. Enjoy it while you can, guys. the way to 6,000 at standstill. It sounds unbelievable. All right, let's now instead start it up in GT mode and you can see the difference. In fact, if you hold the start button, you get a more sedate one so you don't disturb your neighbors. Still exciting but more sedate. And I actually find it quite funny, this car's got start-stop, and I've never really noticed it in other big performance cars, but when this car, when it starts and stops, it's hilarious, because you get this V12 come alive, and you almost feel a little bit embarrassed and proud at the same time. Anyway, now let's go and give it some revs in sport mode. So this is not sport plus, this is sport. <laughs> just absolutely orgasmic, isn't it? But you know what? It sounds as good on the go. So let's not waste any time. Let's head straight off. And I want to show you what this brute in a suit can do on some open roads. So guys, here we are in the quintessential Aston Martin, big, loud V12 GT. And this is the DBS Super Legera. As you can probably see, just the road presence of this car is absolutely incredible. But let's get straight to it. So this is an in-house designed V12 by Aston Martin, a 5.2 litre by turbo. And Aston liked to talk about the 900 newton meters of torque. And I've heard it so much that I forgot about the horsepower number of this car, which is a staggering 
715 brake horsepower. 715. I mean, these kind of numbers were saved for hypercars back in the day. And back in the day isn't more than a decade ago. So this is incredible power for what is essentially a Super GT from Aston Martin. And as you'll see, if you ever drive this brute, it's maniacally fast. Rarely have I been so afraid of a car. But the Aston Martin DBS commands respect. I mean, yes, it's called Super Legera, Super Light, as we discussed, but it is still 1.8, 1.9 tons when weighed up with a full tank and it's very different say having 650 brake horsepower in a 488 and going very fast it's a light car but having 700 odd in a heavier car like this it's truly something to experience and you must remember all of that is going to the rear wheels there's no four-wheel drive system here It is so fast, and you really do feel the torque figure that Aston likes to talk about. No pun intended. It's really, really the punch you get when you put your foot down. I mean, this car, I was at 75 miles an hour there, and it's wheel spinning. You can see the traction control lights going crazy because there's so much power going to the rear wheels. Yet, the Aston builds power with such grace that even the amateur driver would have no issues enjoying this car. Astons have never been about off the line pace, but the 060 is still meant to be 3.4. I would imagine in real world testing, it's gonna be a little bit slower than that, given the amount of power involved. But the beauty of the DBS in terms of delivering power is that it gives it in the most usable day-to-day -day rev range you get that massive boost of power from 1500 revs onward. And what it makes this car is so usable when it comes to overtaking and daily driving. And in daily use, that's where it really counts. You want to be able to suddenly access that power. Of course, those carbon ceramics are absolutely epic. The stopping power from 100 down to almost zero. It's effortless in this car, and you need it with a car with so much power. Now, I'm currently in sport mode, both on the suspension and the drive, and I've tried Sport Plus. I'll put it in there now. It's already so fast in sport, I almost feel like a printed form should come out in Sport Plus, saying that you wave Aston Martin Lagonda PLC of any liability should you go and kill yourself, because sport is one of those cars where the mid-level is just fine. I really think you do feel that 180 kg of downforce as well. The car doesn't suddenly lift like a lot of Super GTs would. It stays planted and you feel the rear sitting low and the front sitting low. Now let's talk about the suspension setup and the handling now. The base of this car is essentially DB11. So you've got a double wishbone front, multi-link rear suspension, which is all fairly standard. Alongside Aston Skyhook adaptive dampening, which you can obviously change from the steering wheel. But essentially, it's the same as the DB11, but there have been some areas which have changed. So the car now sits five millimeters lower than the DB11. The DBS has got more camber, it's got firmer bushings, it's got a thicker anti roll bar, all done to increase rigidity and the handling experience. And indeed, even the steering here, the electronic steering, has been modified to give you more feedback. And it's something I really feel the steering because when I drove the DB11 V8, you guys will remember, one thing I said that the feedback wasn't quite there, but you put this car into Sport or Sport Plus and you're getting so much more communicated to you. Though I'm not convinced it's just the steering, I think the width of the car, the wider tires, the P0s we've got on here, the fact that you've got a bit more camber, all of this contributes to it just having so much more satisfying steering than the DB11 did. I've been very fortunate to try all of this new generation of Aston Martin. And it's funny, it's really interesting to see how the cars have evolved. You kind of go from the DB11 V12 to the V8 DB11, which we tested, and the car just handled that much better, eh, thanks to the lighter engine, but they just worked over time on it to hone the handling of the DB11. But you could see the hand of Mark Webber just slightly modifying things over time. And then we went to the Volante and it had the same driving dynamics essentially as the Coupe. 
Now, Mark Webber, in case you guys don't know, petrol heads, Will Dunn, used to work at Lotus in terms of handling, but not just for Lotus cars. Lotus was, of course, a consultancy as well. So he worked across a lot of different body types. And I think he's really enjoying his job now at Aston, fully controlling how these cars handle. You can see how they change. Then when you go from DB11 to Vantage, which I think is the sweetest handling Aston, of course, it's a pure sports car. That car feels like it's got rear wheel steering. Then the DBS, although the DB11 V12 is probably the worst handling of the lot, still being decent, this car has to improve thus on that car. And it does it in a dramatic way that I would say that this car now sits in between the DB11 and pretty close to Vantage. And the fact that it's just close to Vantage in such a big GT car is amazing. To put down that power, the car's now got an updated ZF torque converter. Um, it's essentially been updated to handle that power. And it really goes through the cogs quite beautifully. I love how accurate Brut in the suit is. I mean, sometimes, you know, marketing departments just get it wrong, but you could not have given this car a better name. The way it looks, the way it picks up speed in such a dramatic way. 80 miles an hour kick down. It's ridiculous how fast this goes. Now, we've had a lot of fun in this. Probably too much. I can smell something burning. <laughs> um, so let's put the car back into GT mode on both the suspension and the drive. Now the great thing is, although you can do all of that in the DBS, you can also just stick it in GT mode and it's as usable as a normal DB11. I think it's a little bit more firm on the road. There's just something nice about having that feeling of raw road coming through the suspension and the steering wheel. That being said, although you get that and immediately you're almost apologizing to your passengers that, sorry guys, I know the way it looks, but this is a supercar. But it's equally, once you pick up speed and you're going along a nice road, it's nice and sedate. And you can do miles and miles. It is a continent conqueror, just like the best DBs are. Add the fact that you've got the Daimler brain in this car, which is well tested over many years. Works really well, very reliable. It sheds the burden of the past that you look at a previous DBS, for example, or a Vanquish or something, and you'd have qualms over getting one because of maybe the tech or some perceived unreliability. One thing that you will absolutely cry about, and this is where the super element comes in, is the fuel consumption. You could even see that since I've been driving, it's already chewed up more than a quarter of a tank in what, 10 minutes? It's exactly as you expect a spectacular V12 should be. This Super GT niche is a very small one, but it's got quite the burden on it because a lot is expected of this car. When the car comes on the road, it needs to drop the proverbial mic. It needs to be like when Bond enters the scene in a movie, everything has to go slow motion and the car takes over the road. And the DBS does that with ease. Whether you love the design or not, you will snap your neck just trying to get a glimpse of this gorgeous body. It needs to have maniacal power, so much power that you would fear using all of it. And as you probably gathered by now, the DBS has that and more. That is then the super equation. And of course, this has got the sound side of the super equation locked down pretty hard as well. But you see, the car also needs to be comfortable. It needs to be the conqueror of continents. It needs to be a chewer of miles. And being based on the DB11, it's got GT within its blood. Being a two plus two seater, it really leaves this car in quite a unique position compared to cars of a similar price, like say the 812 Superfast. And considering the audience this is aimed at, which is adults with kids, this is a very persuasive factor indeed. But despite the requirement for comfort, this Super GT niche needs to also handle as close to a supercar as possible. Two completely diverging goals here that this car needs to be able to do. And as you've seen, it handles incredibly well given the size of the car and the amount of power going to the rear wheels. This is like the Super Daily. It's gotta be fast, it's gotta handle well, it's gotta have loud noise, but equally, it's got to be comfortable. It's got to have space, it's got to have seats. 
it's got to be able to chew miles without tiring you out. It is literally the ultimate daily formula that this car has to hit. And it's not an easy one to do. But you see, that's why the DBS is so compelling to me. Because you tell me of another car that has the aggression of something like the AMG GTR on the outside, has four seats on the inside like an eight series. It's got a 700 plus V12 engine and is synonymous with an on-screen superhero. There's nothing else like this car. And no matter what comes out in the future from Gaiden, this is as pure as an Aston Martin is gonna get. It's a big GT that looks incredible, handles well, and has a huge V12. Guys, enjoy this format of car while you can. Guys, thank you so much for watching this review on the Aston DBS. I hope you enjoyed it. Please do like and subscribe, and I'm gonna enjoy myself again.